This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Van Alphen. I'm Chief Curator at the American Numismatic Society. I'd like to welcome both our live audience as well as our virtual audience to tonight's Money Talks. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jerome Jean Bou, who is a professor of modern history at the University of Lille in France. He was formerly curator of uh, coinage of modern times at the Cabinet de Medaille at the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, that's the metal or the coin cabinet at the French National Library in Paris. Um, Professor uh, Jean Bou is an expert in archaeological numismatics for the Ministry of Culture in France. He is also an expert on the Numismatic Scientific Committee for the Banque de France. He has published extensively um, over the last many years. He recently published an article in the ANS's own Journal of Early American Numismatics entitled The Coins of the French West Indies Company Made for the Islands and Mainland of America. And he recently published yet another book, uh, which is a catalog of, of American money in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France's uh, collection. So it is my great pleasure to introduce him tonight and uh, to uh, have him engage in a little bit of myth busting on coinage of uh, coinages that have been attributed to various pirates. So with that, turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, dear Peter. And uh, I want first to thank uh, the American uh, Numismatic Society for its uh, invitation. Um, in numismatics, as in history, many myths have been created and remain, probably because the public is more interested in stories than in reality. However, this is a problem because these myths have often been been created by non-specialist authors, often novelists, and later entered the historical discourse. This is the reason for my talk this evening to dispel some myth about some famous so-called pirate coin. A pirate was a criminal who violated, who, sorry, violated property rights stealing from victims their goods at sea. Any product or object with a market value was therefore likely to arouse his desire. Coins were, of course, one such object of desire, and it is this that interests us today. We seek to know if coins were particularly prized and treasured and which one were preferred to such a point as to become so-called pirate's coins. It is, in other words, the contents of the mythical treasure chest that we are trying to determine. If it existed at all. Because, and I apologize in advance, I will perhaps destroy your kids' dreams and yours. <laughs> Indeed, thanks to a careful reading of the existing literature, the study of unpublished French archives, and the recent contributions of maritime archaeology, we can reconsider the question. Our focus here is essentially the 17th and 18th century and mostly the western part of the globe. The image of the parrot, whatever the region that is coarse, goes hand in hand with the image of booty. This booty can be diverse, but must often take the form in the collective imagination revealed by literature and relayed by the cinema of coins. A numismatic treasure whose accumulation and hiding necessitate a chest or a coffer. As a symbol of wealth, because they are often made with precious metals, 
coins are said to be the lifeblood of piracy. Along with other artifacts having the same valuable reserve function, such as goldsmiths, silversmiths, and jewels items. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alan. However, it must be agreed that this mythic association of ideas is relatively recent and was probably best described by, by Charles Helms in 1837 in his famous Pirates' Own Books. With the name of pirate is also associated ideas of rich plunder, caskets of buried jewels, chests of gold ingots, bags of outlandish coins, secreted lonely, out of the way places, or buried about the wild shores of rivers, and explore the sea coast near rocks and trees bearing mysterious marks indicating where the treasure was at. And as it is his invariable practice to secret and bury his booty, and from the perilous life he leads, being often killed or captured, he can never revisit the spot again. Immense sums remain buried in those places and are lost. Indeed, Contemporary testimonies, such as those written by the surgeon Alexandre Olivier Exmelin, or by the writer hidden behind the pseudonym Charles Johnson, regularly evoke the astronomical metallic products of pillaging, to which we will return. But the light nine poses a big problem, which drives all the treasures hunters totally crazy it was only in the 19th century with the literature of robert Stevenson, stevenson and the drawings of Howard pile that the pirates was definitively associated with a treasure of gold and silver riches the former described a quest for old in Treasure Island, originally published in London in 1883. While the latter illustrated pirates, pirate story, stories as seen in its most famous picture entitled Buried Treasure. And for years, children's toys like Playmobiles always gave us the same image. But contemporary representations of famous pirates are indeed devoid of such associations. We never see a coin. It is whether their ominous air and their crimes which are shown and insisted open to scare the public, naval battles, burnt cities, etc., like the engraving of the French pirate François Lolonnais. If one of them does appear with his booty, like the famous Edward Titch, alias Blackbird, it's composed of barrels and bars marked with the monographs of the disported owners indicating the taking of merchandise rather than cash. The booty in goods was, in fact, a much more frequent royalty than in coins. 
For example, according to a report on the prices taken by the privateers of Martinique against the British between January and May 1695, I didn't find data for pirates, but for these privateers, only one of 24 ships board carried some cash. The other cargoes captured consisted of dried or smoked beef, lard, salt, sugar, butter, cheese, and hardware. Precious metals, in any form, attracts pirates. Before being converted into coins, vessels, or jewelry, the ore, more or less modified, crosses the sea. Gold border for, from Guinea, nuggets from Colombia, silver ingots from Mexico and Peru were choice prey. Ex Malin, for example, tells us that these were part of the ransom claimed by the terrible Henry Morgan from the Spanish of Portobello in Panama in uh, 1668. From an unpublished French archive, the steward of the West French Indies, Jean Baptiste Patoulet, relates how, in 1679, French filibusters from Santo Domingo went fishing for silver salmons, big ingots like these fishes, on a wreck grounded in the Baham Chanel of Florida and Cuba. Capturing the equipment used by the Spanish to accomplish this objective, they recovered 140 pieces worth maybe 600,000 French livres, a considerable sum. This amount would equate to about five tons of silver, and the salmon ingots should have a weight of about uh, 35 kilograms each, like the ones of, uh, from the uh, famed Atocha wreck. Treasure hunters However, should be wary, not everyone is a French Dominican filibuster. Some years ago, Barry Crawford believed that he had found an ingot like this on a wreck in the Pirat Bay in Madagascar, which he thought belonged to the famous William Kidd's ships. Ship, sir. Amounted by the Malagasy authorities with sensationalist headlines in the international press, the discovery of this ingot turned out to be disappointed as it was in fact a lead weight of about 50 kilograms. Gold was often more in its native than refined form, especially when it, be, when it came from the West African coast. Another, an unpublished French archive, tell, tells us that of Sao Tome Principe, the proceeds of an Irish pirate's booty were distributed in gold ounces to his crew in 1699. Precisely, three ounces of gold for the officers, two for the sailors, etc., etc. And some native gold was found aboard the Queen Anne's Revenge, one of the Blackbird ships that sunk off North Carolina in 1718, uh, the, only, the only real gold remains from the wreck, from this wreck. Gold and silver also traveled in the worked form of gold and silverware in substantial proportions between the old, old continent and the new world. It was mainly silverware, precisely, precisely um, 
8,000 sterling pounds that a ship and a boat bearing the black and red flag took in uh, 1718 from the Alain, an English ship stopped at Saint Vincent after molesting its crew. Some of the silver booty are just as famous as the men who stole them. The pirate chief David, for example, brought back broken silver from the sack of Granada in Nicaragua in uh, 1665, Lolone from the sack of Maracaibo, Venezuela in 1668, etc. We say broken silver because the silver plates and vessels were, were deliberately broken up to be less voluminous and easier to transport. The looters did not keep the silverware in good condition and don't use, didn't use. Coins are, of course, also part of the pirate catch. They looked for them, sometime accumulated them, but above all, they often spent them. Sometimes of coins are frequently mentioned in comparary sources. Foremost of all, the famous Reales de Ocho, or pieces of eight, the Spanish silver dollar. For three centuries, several, several types succeeded one another. The piece of eight circulated everywhere in the Caribbeans, in the America, where it formed part, part of a lot of booties. The Portobello sack, for example, would have stripped the inhabitants of 100,000 coins in 6068. The one of Maracaibo, 30,000 in 1669, etc. Carried back, back sorry, to total islands by filibusters. This large volume of coins was used for transactions with, patch, with passing sorry, merchants. After sharing the booty among the pirates, it was also spent without restraint in their parties or orgies. ex Malin testifies, I saw a man in Jamaica who had given 500 pieces of eight to a prostitute just to look at her sex. If the sum is considerable and undoubtedly excessive, it represents 13.5 kilograms of silver. His statement attests to a very high availability of this coinage and know, dear Peter, the intensity of his desire. <laughs> no other civil coin have, has ever been so successful. The gold coins, less frequent than silver ones in the right hand sources, are mainly Spanish doubloons, the uh, uh, coins, uh, the, the eight escudos coins and also Portuguese moed, uh, the um, uh, 6,400 um, uh, coins, reis coins, and their division. Many examples of these coins dating from the late 17th and 18th century struck in Peru, Colombia, and Mexico are originating from La Flota de Indias, lost in uh, 1715, uh, have been recovered on the coast of Florida. But as soon as this disaster happened, the rescue camp quickly set up by the Spanish was attacked by pirates who, under the leadership of John Wills 
and Harry Jennings sized a large quantity of these doubloons as well as many pieces of eight. The end of the 18th century was the time of the Moed popularity. During this period, the French privateers, based on Guadeloupe, acted more like pirates, to the point that a war was nearly start between the United States and America and France. Another unpublished French archives tells us that one day in January 1799, off the coast of Dominica, the French privateers of the Sirene boarded an American ship from Baltimore. Their snat, a belt containing 100 moed from the captain Samuel Church, which he was wearing around him. This large and heavy gold coin even made the legend of one of these French Guadeloupean privateers. The captain Antoine Fouet from Guadeloupe once battled an English ship in 1796. When he was short of ammunition, he loaded the cannon with Moed, which fired the hold of his ship, the Thérèse. With blows worth at least 100,000 golden leaves, he defeated his enemies. And the narrative tells us that more than 100, 1,000, um, 1,800 coins were recovered from the ship hull and 200 from the dead bodies. We spoke about it <laughs> yesterday. Uh, uh, it's horrible, but it's probably, I think, the most beautiful way to be murdered for numismatics. <laughs> so, so Fue got the nickname of Captain Moed, like Captain America, you know. The fact that this story might be exaggerated, like the precedent story, is not the main point. It relies on two important elements, the presence of Portuguese gold coins in the parent end and their potential profusion. It is not different from what we say about the pieces of eight. The text make silver pieces of eight, gold doubloons and moed, the most common coins used by pirates in the 17th and 18th centuries especially in the Atlantic area and more particularly in the Caribbean, the area about which we are the best informed. Though archaeology allow us to confirm, complete or correct this information. Pirate wrecks have offered up coins among their archaeological material. However, there are few and, extre and extremely sorry varied. And as the author of the recent book on the Queen at Revenge pointed out, we rarely find in these ships the mythical treasure chests wished by our imagination. On a wrecked pirate ship, one might accept to find a treasure chest filled with coins and lots of them. Well, sorry, gold diggers, that is not the case for the queen's, the queen, sorry, and revenge. Only six ships definitively associated with pirates have been discovered and excavated. Two in the Indian Ocean, two in the Atlantic Ocean, and two in the Caribbean Ocean. They are there. Dated 
dated from 1700, uh, 1700 and 1720s. Only the Wida Gali had revealed a substantial number, number of coins. But the condition of the excavation and the lack of clarity in the affirmation given by those involved in the recovery allow us to know only very partially uh, what the contents were. Since we are in the United States, let's look at the two pirate, uh, py pirate wrecks discovered off the coast of North Carolina roughly comparable since they sunk uh, in the same period, the Queen at Revenge and uh, the Widagali. The coins from the Queen and Revenge are the scarcest and the most disappointed, as this mythical wreck as was highly prized. But the conditions of its loss probably a scuttling, can explain that. Only four, only four American Spanish silver coins were recovered from the ship and small denomination of one or half a real, real. These are divisions from the famous piece of eight of which no examples have been found. Their scattering and isolation of the site suggests that uh, there may be uh, personal effects lost during the abandoning ships or forgotten remnant, uh, remnant sorry, of an important or more important monetary deposit, but we don't know. In addition, a monetary weight was recovered, regularly presented as the masterpiece of this excavation, since it contributes to the identification and to the dating of this wreck. This corresponds to a gold guinea used to weight the central unit of the English monetary system. Many types of Guinea weight are known, but by change in time. This one bears an effigy representing Queen Anne, the British sovereign who gave her name to the chip. On the same coast, the near contemporary with Dagali has so far provided the most numerous numismatic materials, but it's an exception, it's the only one. According to the testimonies of the time, the ship under the command of Samuel Bellamy, Noah Black Sam, sunk by accident during a storm loaded with the pirate's booty. This consisted of about five tons of gold, silver and jeweled including at least 400,000 coins robbed just a few weeks before um, before the shipwreck, um, maybe to, um, on the, 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 the site of the, 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 the lost fleet uh, of Spain. By cross-checking the information related to the excavations conducted over the course of 30 years, more than 15,000 coins could have been recovered from the wreck to date. According to the photographs diffused by different media and the list published by Clifford in 1999, the coins are exclusively Spanish America, pieces of eight, doubloons, etc., precisely and made coins called Macuquinas from the means of Mexico, Lima, Potosi, Cartagena de Indias, and Santa Fe de Bogota. The oldest coins date back 
uh, to the early uh, 17th uh, century. Archaeological finds of pirate coins are even scarcer on land than in the sea. This is mainly because when a monetary deposit is found on land, it is even more difficult to know to whom it belongs than it is for a wreck, because it's more easy, it's easier to identify a wreck than a sign. Certified pirates' treasure are consequently uncommon. Some private enterprise led by individuals motivated by money claim to have found or want to find deposit. For example, a certain judge banner having gotten the coordinate from a companion of Bartholomew Roberts, an English pirate who scored the Caribbean and the African coast in the early um, 1720s, uh, found in the state of Maine in 1878 a part of his treasure consisting in gold doublons and a diamond cross, but no pictures and no list of the discovery was never established. Um, no. In truth, no official archaeological excavation campaign has ever had the opportunity to excavate such treasure. Also, no lost coins have been found in isolation on sites clearly identified as having associations with pirates. Even so, Robert Marx, in, in 1968, entitled his book on Port Royal, Jamaica, the Pirate Port. It was never entirely pirate. Certainly, the famous pirate Morgan stayed there and then became its governor. But in the town, Puritans also stayed there before the earthquake, the it, sorry, the earthquake that destroyed it, the this town in uh, 1692. So. To whom should we give the pieces of eight dated 6050-6090 and issued from Peru discovered during these excavations? It's impossible. However, with some regularity, sets of coins looking like pirates' coins or scattered finds in areas where they might have landed are attributed to them without any scientific proof. Robert Lacombe, in 1956, in his early but unique study of the Santo Domingo coins, Santo Domingo coins, had a lot of imaginations. He wrote, also poor, Philibusters and Buccaneers had to bring to Santo Domingo some French coins, strange, that were found in the Haiti ground. Like a testoon of Henri II, perhaps brought by Francois Leclerc, known a wooden leg, who was the first privateer to operate on, uh, on Turtle Island, precisely around uh, 1560. So one coin, one man, but without proof. In his publication of the treasure of pieces of eight, uh, treasure, sorry, of pieces of eight minted in Peru and probably hidden around uh, 1690, Robert Nesmith, an American specialist on treasure, tre treasure hunt, introduced is um, 1940, 1946 uh, article 
with an extract from the preface of the parrot's own book, giving rise to confusion about the treasure owner. However, there was no indication that this old, an old of Makukinas, had been hidden by some pirate. This type of coinage circulating well outside their criminal circles. In the recent book on the Queen Anne's Revenge, the authors wrote there the pirates had a penchant for gold and silver, adding gold guineas, of course, were very popular among pirates. This inclination for gold and silver, the two most precious metals on the market, is a truism. It is difficult to imagine a strong interest in lead or brass. Beyond the universal fondness for guineas, gold coins from the English monetary system and the discovery of, of the unique monetary weight, nothing proved that they were more appreciated than other coins. For his part, the Mexican historian Carlos Marichal wrote in 2007, it is common knowledge that the English pirates of the 17th century uh, greedily sought out pieces of eight and considered themselves particularly fortunate when, in addition, they found doubloons on the ships they sighted. Public knowledge, public knowledge, is taken as proof. Is taken as proof. Is a proof. Without any citations, of course, to back up the statement. It's strange. <clears throat> It is therefore easy to understand the reason for the identification of pirate coins. All coins, all species of precious metal, by definition, are interesting to them. So all could potentially be pirate coins. The Spanish American coins made, made by hand, the Macuquinas are consequently re regularly nicknamed by numismatists pirate coins on the pretext they are circulated near the areas their schemes their, their, sorry schemed they could as well be an ulterior motive to sell the coins at an inflated price the marketing stunt is not new. In 1968, British Petroleum, BP, created several series of tokens offered in exchange for full tanks of gasoline. It could be possible today, isn't it? <laughs> One of which was dedicated to the pirate's treasure, including a selection of Makukinas. In this way, BP participated in the overharping of this coinage. But we must just remember that Spain provided, thanks to its American mines, 80 to 90 percent of the world's gold and silver across no less than half on the known world. It is a pity that some numismatists are still there, there, are still there today. The mythical piece of eight perfectly illustrated, illustrates sorry, this phenomenon and merits again our attention. This coin was the name of the title of chapter 27 of the Stevenson book. And it is the coin that serves as a warning for Long John uh, Silver's parrot, you remember, when he cries out, 
at the side of the hero, pieces of hate, pieces of hate. I'm a very good parrot, isn't it? <clears throat> so, but it's just in this Stevenson book. In line with this tradition, the pieces of hate has recently regained fame at the central object of the third parrot of the Caribbean movie by Gov Verbinski in 2007. During the meetings of the Brotherhood of Parrots, each of the nine, nine sorry, gang leaders present the coin of eight, which testifies to his, to his legitimacy. It is in reality an object that represents their status because, the story goes, the parrot had to replace the real pieces of eight that they lacked in limb times. The filemaker is also well versed in numismatics since he puts in the hand of the hanged parrot child shield in the first century of the film, a real and authentic coin of eight mint in Seville under Philip II. But none of this can indicate that the pirates had a monopoly on the piece of eight, not even close. In fact, the pieces of eight circulated widely in the 18th century, the period in which Stevenson, Stevenson sorry, or Verbinski uh, intrigues are set. And the piece, is, the piece of eight, sorry, even had no competition across vast territories around the world. ex Malin recognized that French West Indies, the common cause, were Spanish pieces of eight because there was not French coinage. Its success was worldwide. It even became universal and was the ancestor of your dollar. In fact, the pirate coins are just those of everyday use depending on their availability. It is not possible to give them the doublons or the moed or even the pieces of eight. To summarize, pirates' treasures were more in kin than in precious metals. The precious metals they robbed were both raw and coined. Money being money, they side the available coins. No kind could be particularly attributed to them, and no more the piece of eight than another. Don't bother looking for pirate treasures that don't exist, except for an accident, except the exception of the Widagali. Pirates spent their cash enjoying life, enjoying a dangerous and short life until they die. When this cash, this cash wasn't recovered by the authorities when they were arrested. The archaeology of piracy, of piracy, sorry, looks like an edge treasure hunt in which individuals and unscrupulous companies shamelessly engage. Let the pro do it, like my friend John Soleil in France, under the risk to destroy irreversibly our common heritage. heritage. To conclude, studying monetary circulation within a single social group is difficult, especially when this group is small and has left few first-hand archives and materials. Piracy is a rather common subject of study, 
but the sources for its understanding are heterogeneous, polluted by myth and often poorly treated. Only the study of material sources, and I have shown, along with the study of archives, can provide conclusive contributions to our knowledge. It is therefore necessary to preserve and to study both. I thank you. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.